All right, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Cocktails and Fish Tales tonight. This is our last Cocktails and Fish Tales event of 2023, but don't you worry, we'll have a whole new series ready for you next year. Uh, a couple of just quick announcements before we turn it over to Patrick here. Uh, main thing, you should all be saving the date for our annual benefit, Make Waves. This is our ninth annual. It's going to be hosted here at Ocean 5 on October 19th, 6 to 9 p.m. It's going to be a blast. There will be food. There will be cocktails. Bring your friends. Uh, and this is our hope to make $5,000. Not $5,000, i am sorry, fifteen. One more zero, one more zero. We did a, you know, I'm good at setting really doable goals. But yeah, let's see, let's see. $50,000. So uh, tell your friends about it. We'd love to have you um, to support our learning and having fun um, and just our education endeavors through Harbor Wild Watch. The other thing to keep on your radar is our period to the night programs are coming back as that chill of fall starts creeping into the air. So first Saturday of the month, October through March. March, December, January, February, March, we will be out on a local dock here in Gig Harbor. The one on October 7th will be at Jerisich Dock. We'll have our drone that flies through the water under the piloting professionalism of Rachel's lovely husband, Jen. Rachel will be there to tell you all about the fantastic things that you're seeing live on the silver screen. So you get to hopefully stay dry. We'll at least promise you don't get salty. You can't control the rain. We'll do this program, rain or moonshine. So bundle up, <laughs> bring a chair, bring some blankets, uh, get cozy on the dock and enjoy learning about what lives in your Erie Gig Harbor. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and shift on over to the lovely Patrick Hutchins here uh, from SR3 uh, to tell us more about the fabulous work that they do um, in our communities, uh, protecting our marine mammals and such. Um, thank you, Sue. Uh, yeah, so like Sue mentioned, my name is Patrick Hutchins. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for SR3. Um, I promise we'll talk about what that name means in a second. <laughs> um, but we are uh, Washington's first wildlife rehab hospital specifically dedicated to ocean animals. Uh, and we've only been open for a couple of years, so it's been a really interesting process. And I titled our talk, What Are We Going to Do About This uh, Tonight? Because um, historically, the Northwest didn't have a lot of rehab support. The Seattle Aquarium, Wolf Hollow, which is on St. Juan Island, and the Progressive Animal Welfare Society, or PAWS, which is up in Linwood, have done a lot of great work for years um, trying to rescue and rehabilitate marine mammals, but have had really limited capacity. And so uh, when our executive director, Casey McLean, moved here uh, from um, I don't remember exactly where she moved around a lot, but um, when she moved here, she saw that there was uh, not a dedicated wildlife rehab facility for ocean animals and was like, well, what are we going to do about this? There's a lot of work to do. Uh, and so um, we're going to talk a lot about how we've been working on that and um, how you all can get involved as well. Uh, this is kind of the highlight of a lot of what we do, and if you follow us on social media, you'll see a lot of sad baby seal on the beach moderately happy baby seal in our rehab center, very happy baby seal out in the ocean again. Um, this is Corvus, who is an animal who actually came to us from um, Burien, just south of Three Tree Point, um, and was very sick and malnourished when he first came in and then got back out into the wild. It was quite healthy and happy. Um, and bump over to our next slide. Um, just to mention a little more about myself, so I have a background in environmental education. I started as a um, interpretation volunteer at the Seattle Aquarium Touch Tanks, so um, similar to going to um, Wild Watch's facility and doing uh, work there. Uh, that kicked me off into a career where I was like, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, so here's me giving an octopus talk at the Seattle Aquarium. I worked there on and off for about a decade. I got my scuba cert. Um, I like to have a lot of fun and play around in the ocean. That's me using kelp as a trumpet. If you didn't know you can do that, it's the best thing ever. Um, <laughs> And then I went to the very, very serious and prestigious College of the Environment at Western Washington University and got my degree in environmental education. 
Um, so I have a background mostly in talking to folks about these things rather than doing the actual study myself. So I rely on our wonderful coworkers um, to kind of share the scientific knowledge with me and then I kind of weave the stories from there. So that's what we're gonna try to do tonight. Um, we go to our next slide. Um, I wanna really acknowledge the fact that we are on the traditional territory of the Puyallup uh, Nation and that um, a number of tribes and bands were vocal to Gig Harbor specifically. Uh, so there was a village at the north end of the bay uh, called Tualalcut, uh, and uh, a specific band within the Puyallups uh, lived there year-round, uh, but also uh, the lands were utilized by Suquamish, Muckleshoot, Duwamish, and a number of other tribes uh, throughout the year. And for tens of thousands of years, uh, this um, system of reciprocal relationship with these lands and waters sustained the very species that we are now trying to save. Uh, so what we're doing now is kind of trying to um, take responsibility for the actions uh, that have meant there have been more destructive practices over the last 300 years than the tens of thousands prior. So I just want to acknowledge their responsibility. So the way we meet our mission, which is advancing the health and welfare of marine life in the Pacific Northwest, is through our three R's. So our name, SR3, is an acronym. Um, I tell kids it's like NASA, <laughs> but it stands for Sea Life Response Rehabilitation and Research. So each one of those different R's is one way in which we advance the health and welfare of marine life in the Pacific Northwest. And we're actually gonna go through all of these tonight, but we're gonna go through them backwards because it's fun to be weird. Uh, and <laughs> because that's kind of how our organization evolved. Um, we actually uh, started as a nonprofit about 10 years ago, um, but most folks hadn't started hearing about us until two or three, uh, and that's because we just built our physical facility, which we'll talk about more. But one of the big things that we started out on um, was doing some research on a variety of different animals. We go to the next slide. Uh, oh, the other thing I uh, wanted to mention. So we do a lot of outreach. We get out into the community. We're actually over at the Puyallup Fair um, all this month. Uh, and I would talk to people about what they do, and they'd be like, neat, thanks. And I was kind of like, oh yeah, that, that's kind of a bummer, right? Like, okay, why are you talking to me? Um, so what I really want to highlight tonight is how you can help. So everything that we do is things that you can participate in some way, whether that's directly through us, through supporting groups like Harbor Wild Watch, or just doing things on your own because you are advocates for the ocean as well. If you come to these kinds of things, I know you care about them. Um, and there are actions that you can take in and out of operating within um, Wild Watch or SR3 uh, that are really valuable. So we'll kind of cover those as we talk about research rehab and response. Ooh, I did backwards without <laughs> stumbling. <laughs> we can give it another slide. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a couple of really cool research projects. Um, the one that we're most well known for is our drone research on whales. Um, so this is our research director, Dr. Dr. Holly Fernbach, and she lives up in the San Juan Islands. Um, and she pioneered a technique of flying drones over the top of whales and taking these really uh, incredibly detailed images. What you see here is her actually down in Antarctica studying some of the um, bacterial colonies within uh, whale blows. So literally, they're flying a drone through a whale's exhaled breath and collecting the snot and then trying to figure out what kind of bacteria they have uh, in their nose biota. Um, so they're picking noses remotely. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this uh, work gets done typically every year um, during our winter because it's the summer in Antarctica. Um, but what we see more is these drone images. And let's go to that next one. Um, and you can see we get really stunning photography. Um, these are appearing in a lot of um, popular publications for obvious reasons. Um, but they give us really intimate insights into these animals' lives with very little to no disturbance, especially relative to more traditional things like getting in close with boats. We're flying high up enough above the whales that we believe they don't uh, notice it at all, but the <coughs> doesn't change in any appreciable way. Um, so we can watch them hunt salmon. Um, it's not on here, but there is an image of a mother killer whale 
uh, pulling a salmon and giving it to Groovy uh, while the drone is flying over the top. So we can study all kinds of different species. You can see some humpback whales bubble net feeding down here. Uh, this is a minke whale down in Antarctica. Um, and we, but we're primarily focused on studying those southern resident killer whales. So uh, those endangered orcas that we have. Can we go uh, to our next slide, Stephen? And these are a couple of the images that we have. Um, raise your hand in the audience if you know the difference between a resident killer whale and a transient killer whale. Cool. <laughs> Does anyone not know? Everyone's looking at me, so if you raise your hand, you won't know this. Great. Okay. So um, we have a few different types of orcas in Puget Sound. Um, the ones that we refer to as transient killer whales or Biggs's killer whales, which were named after a scientist who studied them in the 70s. Um, they uh, mostly eat mammals. In fact, they exclusively eat mammals, mostly harbor seals and harbor porpoises. And then resident killer whales, um, which is a name that's kind of starting to fall out of uh, favor because they don't hang out in Puget Sound as much as they used to, uh, only eat fish, and they almost exclusively eat salmon, particularly during the summer. And we'll talk about why that's consequential in a minute. Um, but when we fly over the top of these animals, um, we can get these really detailed pictures of their body. And we know exactly how far the drone is above the whale. And so we can calculate all these biometric details of the whale just by looking at it. Uh, and so we can tell how wide they are along their belly. So we can tell if mothers are pregnant. Um, we can tell if mothers were pregnant and then lost their baby which is data that actually wasn't getting uh, known before because we wouldn't always see them when they were pregnant, but the only way you could know that they um, had or didn't was to see the calf. And so uh, we can actually see the number of actual lost pregnancies within the population this way, which is really uh, unique. But we can also really, uh, in very fine detail, study uh, how fat they are. Uh, fat mammals are happy mammals, uh, especially in the ocean and especially with whales. Um, so we uh, click this over, Sina. So we started looking at um, what's called the eye patch ratio, and so orcas have those white patches on the side of their head that look like eyeballs, um, but the eye is actually just under the patch. Uh, and when we look at them from above, what we want to see is the front of that eye patch area being narrow and the back being wide, and uh, we specifically look at the front of the eye patch to three quarters of the length along and then measure the ratio between a line on the front and a line on the back. Uh, and as a whale gets skinnier, that closes in. And uh, that gives us a really clear indication of how much fat source they have and how much they're burning it for energy. And um, we kind of put these uh, eye patch ratios into weight classes and if an animal gets into what we call weight class five, so the like lowest 20th percentile, um, it will it's a, has an 80% chance of mortality. So because we're monitoring them from above though, and we can monitor them very often because this is a non-invasive procedure and it's relatively cheap, so we can go out all the time and we can uh, have had multiple times where we've inventoried every single southern resident killer whale in the Sailor Sea and been able to say this is exactly how well we think all of them are doing, uh, we've been able to detect that animals are in trouble before they hit that final weight class. And so that data can really make a difference for managers. So um, let's go to our next slide. Um, and what we found is that uh, a couple of the different pods have really, really strong associations with specific runs of salmon. So uh, specifically the Chinook salmon, which are the largest species, J-Pod, which is one of the most famous, um, J2, I think, her name is Granny, um, is probably one of the oldest orcas that we ever know of. Um, she was believed to be over 100 before she died. She was in this um, pod, and there was an extremely strong correlation between how abundant the Chinook salmon were uh, in the Fraser River that year and the body condition of all the whales that we observed. Uh, so we know that if we can protect the Chinook stocks in the Fraser and they do well, that our orcas will do better. And then, uh, more relevant for us down here in the Sailor Sea, a weaker correlation but still significant, uh, we found that L-Pod, uh, which is the most numerous pod of orcas, 
had uh, the same kind of relationship with the Chinook in Puget Sound, which are listed as endangered, and are some of the resident killer whales that are listed as endangered. So if we can influence the health and success of the salmon, then we can influence the health and success of those killer whales, which feels like uh, a little bit less of a scary lift <laughs> to me than how am I going to help orcas uh, is how I'm going to help salmon, because they come right up in front of your house sometimes if you have a creek. Um, so let's go to our next one. Uh, and our research is doing that. Um, and we'll talk in a second about uh, how you can help too, but we submit all of this information to Washington Fish and Wildlife. We also send it to the federal government of the US and Canada, and they use it to make management decisions that help support the survival of these killer whales. So uh, that can include things like changing fisheries quotas, that can include things like uh, specifically protecting individual whales by saying like, great, we know this whale is not healthy, don't get close. The rules are different for this specific pond. Um, it's really cool, it's very up-to-date, um, and kind of a unique and innovative um, way of monitoring them. Uh, let's go to our next slide. So, uh, one of the big things when it comes to salmon is land use, right? So how we impact the environment around us has huge effects on salmon, in particular. Um, I put a picture up of Gig Harbor, which has some really, really lovely green space around it. Um, and that's space that needs to stay green. If we're gonna keep having um, salmon in Puget Sound, uh, we need to protect our creeks, and we've done a lot uh, to do that, but we continue to expand and grow. Um, and so communicating with your uh, local government is really valuable. I am a notorious uh, legislature emailer and phone caller. <laughs> um, and it was a huge thing that I was terrified to do at first, and then when I started doing it, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> it feels so empowering to talk directly to a person, even if it's some poor staffer or intern at a desk in DC. Um, but it's just, um, you just kind of realize that somebody's listening when you at least reach out and say something. Um, so I pulled a little bit of information for Gig Harbor. If you ever have land use concerns or curiosities, um, the planning department is always a great place to start, no matter where you live, if you're wondering about how um, land use is happening. Uh, and so you can contact them. And then uh, city council meetings are also really valuable. And they tend to be, um, comments tend to land a little harder in smaller towns. So like going to a city hall, uh, city council meeting in Seattle can be very like, well, okay, that would waste my time. Um, but <laughs> As you get out into the suburbs a little more, it tends to be a little more um, responsive. So, uh, uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but I encourage you to talk to your elected officials. It's a great way uh, to respond. And if you are anyone who um, owns land along creeks or along the waterway itself, um, I really encourage you to look up um, or come and talk to me later about ways that you can um, modify your land use to promote the health of salmon. There are a lot of uh, modifications that we can do that are surprisingly simple uh, that can make a big difference. Does anyone have any questions? Also, I want to leave it open to them uh, if anyone has anything they want to work on further. Cool. All right. Uh, so another area of research that we're doing uh, is really critical uh, from the standpoint of having a rehab facility around. Uh, so we are looking into the genetics of a very, very nasty uh, a little bacterium called leptospirosis. Has anybody ever heard of lepto before? Maybe in dogs? Yeah. Um, so this is a bacteria that uh, very quickly shuts down your kidneys. Um, it is zoonotic, so it can transit between uh, animals and humans and between different species of animals. And in uh, the late spring of last year, out of nowhere, we got three northern elephant seals from around the area of Westport, Washington, who were very, very sick with leptospirosis, which is unusual because this uh, disease is rarely found in elephant seals. It's more often found in sea lions. Uh, and um, diseases often go through these kind of periods in the wild where they will kind of disappear or become very low in the background and then arise again. And in 2015, leptospirosis kind of faded out. And then in 2017, it started to come back. So an important question is, 
where is it hiding when we don't see it? Are there animals that we're not paying attention to, like elephant seals, that it might be posted in and we don't know it, and they overlap on breeding colonies with sea lions at different times of year? Um, and so we are doing um, research to study the genetics of these different varieties of leptospirosis uh, and determine if the type that's in sea lions is also the type that's in elephant seals. Um, and uh, it's a really cool technique and what probably wouldn't have happened if these animals hadn't come into our care, um, which is pretty incredible. Although um, WDFW has also been doing a lot of monitoring along the coast for many years. So, uh, but it's a good highlight, that's all. Um, let's go on to our next slide. Um, we're also studying um, some emerging disease issues in uh, sea lions and trying to learn a little bit more about their care. Um, I love this picture so much. So this is a picture by David Hutchinson from the Se West Seattle Seal Centers of a whole bunch of California sea lions and one stellar sea lion <laughs> on a buoy. And you can really see the difference in size in these animals. Um, but we're studying both. Um, we find that a lot of uh, California sea lions have um, neurogenital cancers. And so we're trying to determine um, exactly what we can do about that and the nature of those. Um, it's a combination of some environmental carcinogens and then a virus, um, similar to how um, HPV can cause uterine cancer in humans. Um, this uh, variety of herpes virus can cause urogenital cancer in um, sea lions. And then we're trying to learn reference ranges for um, healthy sea lion urine. Uh, so, uh, we have for a long time known what, basically what the pea should look like for um, a lot of domestic species, but almost nothing about pinnipeds, uh, marine mammals with flippers. Uh, and so we're trying to learn that so that we can give them better care and understand what's normal and what's not when we look at them in the wild, uh, which is really important. Establishing a baseline is critical, and we just haven't done it for a lot of species. Uh, so let's go on to our next one. Um, and of course, when you're talking about research, it can be like, well, okay, I can't, I'm not a research scientist, or maybe you are. Uh, <laughs> what am I going to do about this? But a lot of uh, the funding that um, we get for our research is through grants through both the state and the federal agencies. Um, can anybody point to which one is Washington State Legislature and which one is the, yeah, Washington's on the left, <laughs> uh, US Capitol's on the right. Um, but these are the representatives for your districts in Gig Harbor. Um, I don't live here, and so I had to look these up, so if anyone knows more up-to-date or accurate information than I do, I apologize. Um, but these are all great folks um, to get a hold of. Um, and I found that one of the big barriers uh, to talking to like anyone about something that may be contentious or that you're passionate about can be that feeling of like, well, they're not gonna really listen, or like we're all in the echo chamber anyway, right? But the echo chamber doesn't break until you start talking through it. Um, and so I really make a point when I know there's something that I care about and I want my legislators to know about it that I talk to the people who I know theoretically aren't gonna listen, because at least I said something. Um, and I think that can be a good thing to do. And you know, just always treat people with humanity uh, even if you don't like someone, even if they do something that is actively harming you, they're still a human being, and being a human is hard. Um, so <laughs> uh, I try to be kind whenever I do it. Um, but yeah, these are the folks you can talk to. Um, no relation, Spencer Hutchins is not <laughs> related to me as far as I know. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we can move on to our next slide. Um, so I mentioned before that we probably wouldn't have uh, learned as much about the lepto condition in those elephant seals if we hadn't uh, had the opportunity to rehab. So it's it's a big deal that we're here. Um, I mentioned that Paws and um, Wolf Hollow have been doing the work for years, um, but we're really upping the state's capacity to be able to um, respond to these animals. So uh, between the two of them, they could only take care of around 10-ish uh, harbor seals a year. And that's it. No other species and only that many. Um, so, in 2021, which was the first year our uh, hospital was open, we cared for 45 patients. Last year, we cared for 49. We're at 31 this year. Um, so we've significantly increased the capacity, and we can treat a lot more um, varieties of animals. 
Um, so let's go over to our next one. This has also led to a massive expansion in our staffing. Um, when I started, we had four full-time staff, myself included. We have 11 full-time staff now, more than 120 volunteers, um, interns, and part-time staff. So um, I'm in the middle on this one just because I'm giving the talk, but <laughs> I just want to give shout-outs to our full team um, who do all kinds of incredible work with very limited resources. But, we, oh, thank you, good question. We're located in Des Moines, Washington. Um, so just up the road north of Tacoma a little ways. If you've ever been down to the Des Moines waterfront, um, which I am uh, pronouncing yes on purpose. Um, it's a Washington thing. Um, <laughs> uh, we're just kitty corner to the Anthony's. Uh, so the facility's only been there since 2021. We started construction in 2020, which fun times building a rehab hospital during a global pandemic. <laughs> a lot of back, back trust building to do. <laughs> but um, uh, it's been a cool project. Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, can we go over to the next one? So we're going to play a little game. Uh, we're going to go through all of the different animals that we can treat, and you're going to tell me what they are. So I call this game, What You Treat In There? Uh, and I just want to highlight um, some collaborations that are in this image too. This is Kelly Lee from the Seattle Aquarium, um, who's one of my former coworkers and a really amazing human being and uh, mammal care specialist. Um, and so this is very collaborative work and they really helped us out that first year um, because these are some of our awesome volunteers and interns, but we just didn't have that many people to start. Uh, so they were really helpful. So let's go to our next slide and uh, this one's a little bit of a trick question, but does anybody recognize this animal? It's perfect. It's coming up on seabird week. It's a, gr a grebe. Not a merganser. It is in the duck family. Is it a grebe? It's a grebe. Does anybody know the species? You kind of guess a red-eyed grebe. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that wasn't the field mark the researcher was thinking of when they named it. Yes. This one. Not crested. This one. Um, can you click it real quick? Oh, okay. I didn't put the name on. This one's a horned grebe. Um, this is one of my personal favorites, but I have the hair on there because we don't rehab birds. Uh, I really want to get that point. We get a lot of calls uh, for like, there's a goose on my lawn, or like, this crow is acting weird. Um, and we do respond, like I mentioned before, with kindness, because people are freaking out. They're worried about an animal. Um, sometimes they just don't know what's going on. We had one caller who like went through the full cycle of like, this crow's dying. Uh, I'm a little worried about it. Actually, I don't know that much about crows. Can you tell me about crows? Wait, I think it's fine. <laughs> Which is my favorite phone call ever. <laughs> um, uh, Paws and uh, Wolf Hollow, and there are other rehab facilities that can care for birds. And if you do call us, we'll help you find them. Um, because just because you talk to us doesn't mean we should be like, sorry. Um, so we'll, we'll help you connect if you need to. Um, but their uh, information is here on the page too, uh, so you can utilize that if you'd like. Okay, so this is one of the types of animals that we can care for. You can shout it out. <laughs> yeah, this is the sea otter. So uh, the northern sea otter specifically is the subspecies, um, a little bit bigger than those ones down in California. Um, and you can always tell a sea otter by their kind of blondish head and the fact that they're usually floating on their back. They also have really big flippers for feet and cute little dexterous hands on the front. Um, we can't care for river otters. So even though they live in the ocean oftentimes here, because they are um, part of the Fish and Wildlife Service, because they're not technically a marine mammal, they're not under our jurisdiction to rehab. So we, if you do have um, worries or problems, they can be smelly and dramatic, uh, they're weasels, um, we, can, we can connect you with the right folks. But if we did get a re, uh, sea otter from the outer coast, we, we do have the capacity to rehab them. Uh, so let's go on to our next one. Ooh, this one's a little trickier. Anyone know? Ooh, it's good guess. It's not a doll's. Harbor porpoise. Yeah, it's a harbor porpoise, yep. Uh, so uh, I tried to get like a ding noise, but it didn't have one. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so harbor porpoises, uh, we can also take care of other small cetaceans like dolls porpoises, um, Pacific white-sided dolphin juveniles maybe. Um, 
we have the permitting and staff with experience working uh, especially with dolphins. Um, often these are animals that by the time anyone knows anything is wrong, they're so sick that the way that we can help them is to humanely euthanize them. Um, that is a practice that we utilize and I like to be honest with people about that. Um, because often uh, when animals like this are far and short, they're very injured or very, very sick. Um, and so to attempt to care for them or to leave them there would be to just allow them to suffer and that's not something that we want to do. Um, but we haven't had a harbor porpoise yet. Um, these first few are species that we haven't cared for uh, and I'll tell you when we jump into the ones that we have. Uh, but let's go on to our next one. Ooh, <laughs> kind of gave this one away earlier. Stellar. Stellar sea lion, yeah. Ooh, nice, I love it. <laughs> yeah, so this is a big male um, up in the San Juans. Uh, they have that really bulky appearance. Um, the other thing you can always tell a California and a sea lion apart, or California and a stellar apart, is by their vocalizations. California sea lions classically go, or, or, or. They're the, um, the San Francisco Bay sea lion. And stellars will go, or, or. So it's really funny. Because you'll be passing by rocks and you'll hear like or 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 and you'll hear one or and you know that's uh, got a mix of the two species. So uh, I love sound effects, so there'll be more. Uh, <laughs> all right, what about this one? Harbor. California. Ooh. Raise your raise one hand if you think it's a California sea lion, raise two hands if you think it's a harbor sea lion. Okay, so we're going to go into a little bit of anatomy here. It is a California sea lion, yeah. So um, sea lions uh, and their relatives can stand up on their flippers. This isn't a great image of it because she's kind of flopped. Um, but they will be able to turn their wrists and their hips under their body. And then they also have ear flaps. So if you see those little ears sticking out on the side, um, then you know that it's some kind of a sea lion or a sea lion cousin. Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go to our next one. Oh, wow! Nailed it, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, another um, sea lion relative, fur seals um, are in the same family as sea lions, uh, but they have much thicker fur, and usually the fur is distributed in different patterns on their flippers. Um, okay, so we're going to move into the animals. We haven't taken in a northern yet. Um, but this is one of the types that we've treated. Does anyone know this animal? Guadalupe Perseo? Yeah, awesome, nicely done. Uh, so this is a Guadalupe Perseo, or we just call them quads because it's fun. Um, but this is my, don't tell the others, this is my favorite patient you ever had. Uh, so his name was Kazoo, um, which was the name that I came up with because uh, they vocalize like this. And, <laughs> It's very hard to have a budget meeting with an animal outside going every minute or two. Um, but uh, if you were like, that looks exactly like a northern fur seal, um, they are very similar. And in fact, uh, Western science did not know that there were two species of fur seals in the Pacific until uh, the late 18, early 1900s when we were like, hmm, maybe we should start writing down what kinds of things we're killing en masse. Uh, and then they were like, oh wait, there's two different types of these. Um, and this is a species that was at the precipice of extinction. Uh, they were uh, so heavily hunted that they were found in exactly one place on one island in a specific cave when they were breeding. And they have bounced back so significantly that they are currently listed only as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So every time we rehabilitate one of these, we're making a huge difference in the future populations of the species. And they're so cool. Um, they're such little punks, I love them. <laughs> um, but let's go on to our next one. I think we recognize this one. Elephant seal. Yeah, this one is a northern elephant seal. So the trick on this one, I, I did this on purpose. This is a female northern elephant seal. So she's a sub-adult, her name is Pickle. She was the first patient we treated this year. Um, and so females don't get the big elephantine nose that we typically associate um, with um, elephant seals. Uh, but they're quite a bit larger, but they are in the same family as harbor seals. So they do not have those external ear flaps, um, but elephant seals will tend to be kind of a mottled gray or brown. They just look like a log, like on the beach. 
um, whereas harbor seals will have um, spots, whether they're uh, dark morph or they're black with white on top or brown or gray or silver, they'll always have freckles, um, which might be why I like them. <laughs> okay, let's go on to our next one. Uh, so this one is a video uh, question, and this one is a little surprising for folks. Okay, so we've got a sea turtle. Is anybody counting the scutes right now and trying to figure out which species it is? do turn up in Washington and Oregon periodically. Um, unfortunately, this is an animal that didn't make it. Um, getting too close inshore in the North Pacific is very dangerous for these animals because the water gets very cold very quickly the closer you get to the shoreline because of um, upwelling from deep water. And since they're a reptile, the body slows way down when they get cold. All of the processes slow down or shut off. Um, their immune system is heavily suppressed. Their ability to digest food is heavily suppressed. This animal was in our care for two and a half months and it didn't eat once. Um, and it was able to continue to swim around and move and do everything you would expect them to do. Um, reptiles are really incredible. Um, like sea turtles were one of those animals where I was kind of like, mm, everybody loves sea turtles. I don't need to worry about them too much. But then we had to do breathing watch for this animal to make sure they were still alive. And you had to check and make sure that at least one time every 10 minutes they took a breath. Uh, so it's an animal that can just kind of operate in a way that we can't even comprehend on a time scale that we don't really understand. Um, and it was just very humbling to be around an animal like that. And so now I absolutely love sea turtles. So <laughs> um, I'm on that team now. Um, yes? Is that the same turtle that you see in Hawaii? Um, it can be. There's several species that um, live in Hawaii, and greens are one of them. Um, that that's, that individual probably wasn't one of the ones that breeds in Hawaii. The ones that we see off the coast of, the, of Washington are typically ones that were born in Mexico um, and then migrate north. Um, but we can see other species as well, which are some of the other ones. You also see hawksbills and loggerheads in Hawaii, I think, and you can also find those off the coast of Washington, as well as the other axe sea turtles, yeah. What's the norm of the animal that you uh, rehab? Is it because of an injury, or is it because of a disease? What happens? Yeah, it's a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, it definitely depends on the species. So with sea turtles, what we're mostly seeing is cold stunning, so they've gotten blown off course somehow, typically by storms, um, and then ended up in water that was too cold, and so we're trying to treat all of the um, injury and disease and complications that happen through that. That elephant seal had a skin condition that we treated with uh, antibiotics, um, and we'll talk a lot more about treating these guys in a minute. So, and that'll be our number one patient type. But we do also see um, boat strikes and those kinds of things as well. Um, all right, so we're finally down to our last one. I think we've exhausted every other animal it could be. What do we got here? Harbor seals. Harbor seals. Harbor seals, yeah. So um, like I mentioned, harbor seals are our number one patient type. So uh, we see more of them than anything else. And there's kind of two reasons for that. One, they're just the most common marine mammal in the Salish Sea. So we're more likely to see them get in trouble than anything else because there are just more of them out there. Uh, and then also, there is kind of a um, aspect of their early life history that makes them very susceptible to being abandoned by their moms. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Um, but when we get one of those kiddos who has been abandoned, there's kind of a process for getting them back up to full size. And that starts with just getting them nice and fat. Um, this is one of our wonderful volunteers, Ariel, um, helping one of our staff, Sydney, to feed a harbor seal. 
Um, this, is, this one is full of fish mash. So this was an animal who wasn't drinking milk anymore but couldn't swallow whole fish for whatever reason. Usually they're just like too sick and they don't feel like it. Um, but we need them to eat something. So we actually put food directly into their stomach via tube. Um, and this is a process um, that's been tried and tested for decades uh, at other rehab facilities. But we usually use a very rich uh, milk formula uh, that gets them nice and chunky real quick again. Um, and then we'll transfer over to the next stage in the process, which is another video. Um, we feed them uh, froze, previously frozen herring, and we have to do this. I just love that he licks his lips at the end. It's so good. <laughs> uh, so uh, we call this process fish school. It's literally teaching them how to eat fish. Um, because the fish are already dead, uh, they don't really understand that they're food. They normally rely on an instinct to pounce on things that move quickly, kind of the same way cats do to learn how to eat. Um, but because we're giving them really high grade uh, food that is previously frozen, they, we have to teach them to eat. So then we move on to a slightly uh, more distant version. Um, this is one of our interns, Nick, doing a tong feed. So you literally like put it on a really nice little reacher grabber and then like wiggle the fish through the water and try and pretend that you're a herring. So um, we learn which of our interns are really observant and which ones are more like, I don't know, whatever, uh, <laughs> when we do this. But um, so they gradually start to figure it out. We go from like literally shoving it down their throat to like, barely pushing on it as they swallow it. And then um, it finally turns into this. consuming those little guys. Um, harbor seals in the wild are generalist predators. They're kind of like the raccoons of the sea. They'll eat literally anything. Um, come up and take a look at the skull later and see um, how versatile their teeth are. But they eat 60 different species of fish. Um, interestingly enough, including some uh, that are significant predators of salmon. So even though we see them eating salmon, they may also be having impacts on the other things that eat salmon and may um, have a beneficial uh, effect, but we just don't know. Um, so we're hoping to study that in the future. Uh, but then it's not all just feeding. There's a lot of other work that goes on. Um, this is my favorite patient of all time. This is Andre. He likes to finger paint. Um, and you can imagine where the paint came from. <laughs> um, so we are constantly cleaning. Um, we go through a lot of sanitizer. Um, and we rely really heavily on volunteers to help us uh, support this work. Um, but all of it is there, um, hopefully, for uh, this result. And uh, just so you know, this video is a little motion sickness inducing, so just heads up if uh, that's a concern. <laughs> That's Aurora uh, getting to go back to the wild out near Blakely Rocks uh, in 2021. Um, so that's up uh, kind of at the entrance towards Farmington. Um, really cool to get to see animals go back in the wild. Um, boat releases are rare. We only do them with certain animals. We actually mostly release from shorelines, often on public beaches. So um, I really encourage you to follow our social media, and those are great ways to find out if we're ever having public releases. Um, and getting involved with our newsletters. Yeah. So I wanted to 
ask you <clears throat> periodically in the paper, they talk about it's the time for the seals, you know, to have the pups. And so if you see any Swiss, leave them alone. How do you know whether they need help or not? Oh my gosh, what a fantastic transition. That's what we're going to talk about next. <laughs> Um, but I just wanted to mention that we are, you know, 501c3 nonprofit, classic. Uh, and so we have opportunities to volunteer in direct animal care. These are some of our folks from this year. You get cool recognition patches as you train. Um, and then we uh, also really rely on the public for donations as well as our grant funding. Um, and it's just a, a personal pitch. Um, it's often the people that make the difference at uh, nonprofits, and so a lot of our promotion is kind of like, here's how many fish you can buy with this amount of money. Um, but if there was a giant, infinite pile of herring and no one to give it to the seals, things wouldn't function. So um, just want to highlight that the humans make a huge difference, um, and we do incredible things with very limited resources. So. Um, that's my high horse. So, <laughs> response. Uh, so we have this really fun ambulance. Um, it's a little better at PR than it is at being an ambulance, but it's important. important. Um, it, it was donated or given to us uh, at a steep discount by the Redmond Fire Department. So it was previously human ambulance, and now it's for seals. Um, and we use it in a couple of different ways. Um, but one of the ways that we don't use it at all is when we work with these animals. So some species are just a bit too big for us to put in our 12 foot diameter pool, and that includes things like this gray whale. So we also have a team who can do um, large whale disentanglement response. And so we see humpbacks and grays in particular, which have rebounded from uh, the pretty close to the precipice of extinction themselves, um, returning in significant numbers, but as they travel from uh, either Hawaii or uh, Mexico to the feeding grounds in Alaska or stopping grounds here in the Northwest. Um, they travel through commercial crab fishery areas in California and Oregon. And so they often become entangled in gear. Um, and let's go to our next slide. Uh, and so you can see some pretty significant scarring on this gray whale's tail from this gear that has wrapped around here. Um, and I like this picture because it also shows you the complexity of most entanglements, right? If there's a, uh, probably this whale got spotted by a commercial fisherman who are critical partners in spotting whales for us because they're on the water all the time. Um, and so they're really uh, important partners in helping us find stuff. There was probably a float from the crab pot sticking up in the water. And most of those videos that you see on like the dodo or you know wherever you go and someone dives in and cuts something free and they're like, woo. Usually they're just cutting a line on the top, and that's not the part of the line that's lethal to the whale. And so what they're doing inadvertently is cutting the thing that tells people there's a problem. So it's really important if you see entangled whales to let people who can come with GoPros, a team, long knives on poles, a lot of equipment uh, to get them free. Because um, this is the part that's the problem. And so the team will go out, they'll soak all around the whale, they'll assess it, um, and actually figure out how to make one cut that they think will loose all of the gear. Um, it's also very dangerous. Um, this is an animal, an adult gray whale is 35 to 40 feet long. So like most of this room. So when you're in a boat that's 10 feet long, you're <laughs> one quarter of the size of it. And they can be scared because they're hurt. Um, so it's really important to make sure that uh, we get folks out there. And SR3 was um, instrumental in starting to build uh, a stronger entanglement response uh, program in the Northwest. Uh, but most of our uh, responding is involved with strandings. So here's uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's definition of a stranding. So it's a mammal that's on the shore and unable to return to the water under its own power. So it can't get back to the water by itself. Uh, an animal on the shore, and even though it can get back to the water, it needs help. It's like obviously hurt or obviously sick or obviously way too skinny. It's an animal that's in the water and it can't get there or it's, um, can't go to where it normally would be found without help. So a great example is like, there was a humpback whale who went way up the Sacramento River a number of years ago, and um, that was an animal that was considered stranded because it was like, ooh, ooh great. Um, so they helped him get back. And then if an animal's dead, that's considered a stranding. 
Okay, so let's go to our next slide. Um, we rely entirely on our public to report those different things. Um, so you can see there's a complex network of different organizations that actually do the stranding response around the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I learned this recently, Washington only has 300 fewer uh, miles of coastline than California does. It's just that we're all like squished up and squiggly. Um, and some of them are pretty remote, right? Like if you've been out to um, Joyce and CQ um, or out to Mia Bay, there's one road <laughs> uh, and it washes out a lot. So having all these incredible partners um, really helps us do a lot of work that we couldn't do just on our own. But from all these places, they can tongue through our facility for rehab. Um, but there are sometimes some of these places have staff on beaches going out to check on animals. Other places just rely on the public to report entirely. So you are absolutely essential to this process. If you aren't out there looking at stuff, paying attention, noticing it's there, and contacting someone, we can't help. Um, so this QR code is a really great way to find the West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network hotline. It'll just literally add it to your phone's contacts. Uh, so you don't have to be like, wait, what was that guy's name and what number do I call again? You can just go to your contacts and swipe it. And I can help any of you um, access that if you'd like. Or we can do it the traditional way uh, as well. So let's go on to our next slide. And since we're relying on you to check out the animals and tell us what's going on, we're going to play a little game called Stranded or Nah. Uh, <laughs> we're going to try and figure out um, if this animal is stranded. So this is a northern elephant seal. Um, this is a male who's been hanging out uh, down and around uh, Beer and Des Moines uh, and West Seattle. Uh, we think it's the same individual every year. And he likes to do this, just sleep on the beach. Um, but he sleeps so deeply that people think he's dead, um, very understandably. Um, many snores. And so people are like, there's something wrong with his lungs. And we're like, yeah, but <laughs> um, he's actually fine. Uh, so let's take a look. We're going to look at an animal here. What do you think? Keeping in mind those stranded. <laughs> Does anyone, what do you think? Healthy. <laughs> yeah, this is a California sea lion. This is, I, I didn't put the like yay or nah on this one. Um, but this is California sea lion that we would call sailing or rafting. Um, they're putting their flippers out of the water to change the temperature of their blood uh, to help either warm up or cool off. And this is very normal, especially in the winter. Uh, but we get a lot of calls about it because people don't know this behavior is normal. Um, and they do kind of look like they're entangled and sometimes they'll like have their head halfway underwater and be like, <laughs> and like blow bubbles. Um, so it can be, can be very uh, alarming. About this guy. Yeah, right, pretty apparent on this one. This is Kazoo, that uh, Guadalupe fur seal that we saw. He was uh, had fishing gear wrapped around his neck. So this is a net that he probably put his head through either to try and catch a fish on the inside or um, he was playing with. Um, if you'd like to see the actual net itself, we have it here um, on display today. So um, pretty apparent. Let's go on to our next one. This one's a little more challenging. Yeah, so you can see kind of a distinct indentation on the stellar sea lion's neck here, right? Um, so this is a packing strap. So if you haven't seen one of these before, um, there are things that are commonly found on boxes of fish or on um, soda, believe it or not. Um, like the, I worked in restaurants for many years, and the um, syrup that gets put in the soda machines often has those on them. And for some reason they put like the, the strongest glue in the universe on these and it won't separate even though they're not all one piece um, and it doesn't degrade in seawater which kills everything <laughs> and so they can get around animals next and they can cause um, pretty significant damage but we were uh, able to work closely with the sea dock society and dart this animal um, get them kind of calmed down and slowed down because they are strong uh, and potentially dangerous and cut this free and this animal has been recited uh, which is really great um, let's go on to our next one. Ah, and now we're getting into harbor seals a little bit, which is where we get into kind of the nitty gritty. Okay, here's some thoughts about skinny. Feel free to just like throw words or ideas out there. That you... Looks injured. What do you see that makes you say he's injured? 
Oh, so thinking about like how, how our bodies are typically in a single line and this looks maybe twisted at an angle. Um, yeah, what more can we find? Oh yeah, where are the flippers? So trying to observe the different parts of the body that we know of um, and seeking those out um, and trying to determine if they're there or not. Yeah, um, overall, this is an animal that definitely needs help. There's kind of a lot going on. They are way too skinny. Um, a baby seal should look like a, a very well-stuffed sausage. Uh, there are far too many sharp angles on this animal. You can see um, this is where their shoulders are, this is where their ribs, and this is where their hips are. These are their rear flippers here. Um, but interestingly enough, these are the legs of the seal. The flippers are their feet. So if you x-ray a seal, they look like us going like this, uh, but all of this part is just wrapped in a single tube. It's like they're wearing a very tight skirt. Um, so you can actually see the ankles and the knees of this seal. So they are way too thin. Um, their fur looks unkempt. Um, they do have all their flippers. They're just wet, so they look dark and are hard to see. Um, but yeah, this is an animal who definitely is in trouble. Let's go on to the next one. Yeah, this is a very happy seal. <laughs> they are nice and round. Um, they also have these really beautiful, their fur looks really healthy. They also have these really beautiful eye rings. So often people will see these and think it's um, like an injury of some kind or they're bleeding, but this uh, means they're hydrated. Because when they're sitting out in the uh, air, they want to keep those big black eyeballs uh, nice and wet. Um, and so they're constantly shedding tears to kind of keep them uh, damp. And so if you see a mostly dry seal with those patches, that's a good sign. It means they're hydrated. Yeah. Yeah, looking pretty good, right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a blurred photo. This is often the kind of image that we get. Um, so if you can, uh, you know, uh, Galaxies and iPhones have incredible cameras now, so you have no excuse. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's a nice chunky seal. They're hanging out on the breakwater, which like that is a place that is hard to get to for a predator, right? So it's a good spot to hang out, even if there's a lot of boats around. Um, so this is an animal that is totally fine. Uh, yeah, so this is Pisces, who was one of our patients last year. Um, they're looking a little rough. You can see. The skin is not stretched out, so you get a lot of those little rolls. Um, that can be a sign that they're too thin, um, and you can start to see some of those things. Interestingly, though, this kind of shabby-looking fur is actually what we call lanugo. It's the prenatal hair um, that the seals have. Some seals are born uh, with it still on, and it falls off like almost immediately. Others, it's shed in utero, and they come out with a full coat. So um, you might see both. It just depends. Uh, okay, I know about this guy. <laughs> yeah, this one's kind of a tougher call, right? It's like, nah, 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 nah. Um, this is what we're going to start seeing this time of year. So, pupping season for harbor seals is typically May to um, September, um, but then they transition away from their mom and they start eating fish on their own. I'm notoriously bad about time, so if I need to shut up, let me know. <laughs> uh, but uh, this animal is clearly learning how to catch fish on their own. They're a little thin, but that's normal, right? Like, we all lose a few pounds before we gain the freshman 15 uh, after our parents stop taking care of us. Um, and so we do see pups being a little skinnier this time of year, but if they don't have any obvious disease and they're not catastrophically thin, and uh, apparently he just likes wearing uh, Ulva as a hat. Um, it's a really flash outfit. The green and the pink are really nice. Um, but anyway, uh, they're clearly doing good. So pupping is one of the big things that we really want to highlight for folks. So they're only with their mom for four to six weeks, uh, which is very brief. But during that time, uh, they're getting one of the richest milks on Earth. It's about 50% fat. It's like 10 times cow milk per human milk. And that's really taxing on mom. Uh, she is literally right on the edge of starvation the entire time she's feeding her baby. And so um, when uh, people get too close, the only way, only context she has to understand is that that's probably a predator trying to kill the pup and eat it. 
So even if you go up to it without touching it, she pops up and looks at you, um, she can get scared enough that she'll abandon the baby because she has to figure out, do I have enough energy to fight off this predator and continue to feed my pup and to keep myself alive? And usually the answer is no, because they are investing so much energy into their babies in this uh, brief period of time. So you especially want to be aware of this um, April through September, and the pups do spend a lot of time by themselves. Be six to eight hours on the shore, um, just hanging out, doing the things that babies do. We see them like playing with their flippers, figuring out that they have feet. It's really cute. Um, and most of that time, they're making this noise. That sounds a lot like someone going, Mom, Mom, right? Um, interestingly enough, there's some evidence that the words mom and dad might actually, they literally mean that because it was the first sound that humans heard and understood as something, um, which is interesting. But um, when they're making it, they're just saying, I'm here, I'm here. You gotta come feed me at some point, I'm here. Um, and mom can hear that up to a kilometer away. And so she'll make foraging dives, grab fish, pop up, pop those little ear holes on the side of her head and listen for that oh, oh, sound. And when it stops, that's when she knows the pup's in trouble. So um, the best thing you can do if you see a baby harbor seal or any marine animal is stay far away. If you're worried about it, um, try to take pictures and then contact the West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network or call us directly and we can connect you with the folks who can come help. Um, it can be kind of a mix of um, animals that we can respond to and animals that we can't. And unfortunately, there are animals, uh, we have limited capacity. We are only so big a faci physical facility and we only have so many staff and volunteers, so there are times animals are gonna get left on the beach. Um, I won't pretend that they'll always get to come into rehab even if they need it. Um, but we can take care of a lot of animals in the year. Um, and we can make a pretty significant difference, and it is because of you uh, that we're able to do that. So kind of highlighting this, stay as far away as you can, keeping your pets on a leash. We see a surprising number of animals that have bitten by some kind of canine, likely either a coyote or a dog. Um, and you wanna check and see if you see any of those things that we watched when we were playing a stranded or not, and then you can call this uh, hotline, even if you're not sure, because we wanna know, like, Hmm, I think this seal might be in trouble. Uh, and so we can find out. Uh, they'll usually get observed for about 24 hours before they come in, unless they're obviously hurt. Uh, so it may be a little bit of a wait. And then help others stay back. That's one of the best things you can do. I've often found that just being like, hey, there's a harbor seal pup here. They're resting. Can you just go up on the breakwater and come back down? They, we really want to make sure to stay away because um, their mom could get scared off if we get too close. People are almost always instantly like, okay. Uh, and move on, which is pretty cool. Every once in a while, you get something a little more grumpy, but uh, the vast majority of the time, you don't. So um, I think uh, that's mostly it. I just want to bring it back around one more time because um, I hear a lot, um, you know, I'm a millennial, and my generation and the one after me often have very bleak views on humanity as a whole. And something I'd just like to remind people is that for about 14,000 years, um, harbor seals and other species that we care about in the Northwest were not threatened by humans, but humans have always been here. And so it's not humans that are the problem, it's how we choose to act as humans. And only about 1.2% of that time have been really causing the problems. And so if for 99, 98.8% right? <laughs> of that time uh, we've been able to do better, then we know we can do it. Um, and that is uh, the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.